I am Matt Clune, your host today and a person in long-term recovery. During this program, we will discuss what we mean when we talk about quality treatment and recovery support services, the diverse types of services available today, and the possibility for individuals with mental and substance use disorders to live healthy and rewarding lives in recovery. Joining in our panel today is Dr. John Kelly, Elizabeth R. Spallin, Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Addiction Medicine at Harvard Medical School and founder and director of the Recovery Research Institute at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Dr. Thomas Franklin is a medical director at Shepherd Pratt and a clinical assistant professor of psychiatry at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Dr. Wilson Compton is a deputy director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse at the National Institutes of Health, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And Dr. Anita Everett is the chief medical officer at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Compton, what is evidence-based practice, or EBP as it's commonly called, and what should the public understand about its importance? Evidence-based practice is a very important concept. What we mean by the term evidence-based practice is fairly straightforward. It means those interventions like taking medications or behavioral therapies or psychotherapy that have been proven through rigorous scientific study to produce the positive outcomes that we're looking for. For instance, medications that are approved by the Food and Drug Administration, our FDA, have gone through at least two studies to show that in a randomized trial, they produce the outcomes that we're looking for. And we can count on that because they've gone through that rigorous study. One of the things that's a little bit that we try to focus on uh, at SAMHSA is fitting what's known in the evidence with what the individual uh, need is. And so sometimes we learn things from evidence that apply to, a, to most people, but, but everyone has their own individual path. And so we try to help people think about the individuality just, you know, against what the literature shows us is the best likelihood that people are going to do well in evidence. I, I think that's an important point. Evidence-based practices often are only shown to work for one certain problem or one certain outcome. And not every patient will have that exact problem. So how do we do the best job we can in practice to link those evidence-based approaches to real-world situations? And I think that's why we need skilled clinicians as well, because it's not blind empiricism. We can't just take a, a, an off-the-shelf treatment and deliver it, but rather it has to be done by someone who has the skill and experience to be able to determine what exactly is needed when, at what point, and in what particular circumstance. Um, because we have a, with substance use disorders and mental health conditions, we have a, a very broad range of you know, heterogeneity or variability in the clinical presentation, in the clinical course, the complexity, and the other kinds of comorbidities that are present. Uh, what are some of the challenges in the development of EBP and making them more accessible to those seeking care so that those in the general public are aware of uh, what, what forms of treatment should I be seeking? Well, some of the, the challenges, of course, in developing evidence-based practices is just the amount of evidence that is available. So uh, how much time and energy and, and cost has been, uh, you know, uh, attributed a portion to those particular practices. So every clinical trial is very expensive to do. So one of the challenges is how much is the quality of the evidence. Now, uh, ideally, we would have randomized control trials, in other words, experimental studies of the highest quality of scientific rigor, um, and have lots of those studies to be able to determine, yes, we have a real effect that is, that is consistent across many different uh, samples. Oftentimes, we don't have that uh, mm -hmm. degree of quality. but So it's really the best available evidence mm -hmm. that we have. I think this is important. It's not always the case that we have dozens of randomized controlled trials um, that we can draw on to make a, a clinical decision, but rather uh, the best available evidence that we have. In terms of your question about um, some of the other challenges, is just um, clinicians' knowledge about what is current state-of-the-art evidence. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, clinicians and programs are extremely busy. Uh, they're very um, uh, hectic places where people are just running to get things done. Mm -hmm. um, and so oftentimes, there's not enough um, uh, uh, time allocated to really uh, train people in the latest practices. 
uh, and, and this is part of a problem, I think, overall with our treatment system, is creating the space and time for them to actually be able to learn about, adopt, implement, and sustain practices which we know uh, uh, actually make a difference. Absolutely. Uh, I think I've read that it takes you know, seven years for uh, an evidence-based practice uh, to actually you know, filter through the medical establishment. Uh, which is, of course, w way too long for practices to change. And it's very challenging for a consumer uh, to be shopping for evidence-based practice when uh, the clinicians themselves uh, aren't aware of what the, the latest evidence is. And I think you made a great point, Dr. Kelly, earlier about just the, the amount of material out there. Uh, I think as a, a practicing clinician, it's very difficult for us to know what to pay attention to uh, many times uh, in the, the din of uh, journal articles and, uh, and evidence, because of course not all evidence is created equal. <laughs> Now here's another thing I think that's very important about evidence-based practice implementation is we should not assume because there are effect sizes, in other words, there are uh, evidence to, there's evidence to suggest that a particular intervention has shown to be better in randomized controlled trials under rigorous conditions, that that same effect size will be produced on implementation in real world settings. And this is why I think, and I think we're gonna to come to this later, um, that we need not just evidence-based practice implementation, but measurement-based practice of the implementation. In other words, we need to measure exactly what is happening to our patients in the real world, in the clinical context in which those interventions are being delivered. Because we cannot assume that we are gonna get exactly the same kinds of effects that we get in, under those rigorous conditions that we would get uh, in a more complex setting. And Dr. Compton raised this issue about the complexity, where because oftentimes there's a lots of inclusion exclusion criteria in those, in those trials, uh -huh. which of course, uh, we have a, a, a much greater mix in our, in our clinical, in our real world setting. So this has been a barrier to implementation because oftentimes clinicians will say, well, wait a minute, uh, we don't see those kind of patients in our clinic. Mm -hmm. Our clinic actually treats different. We have much greater uh, impoverished population that we're treating with much greater complexity, both medical and, and psychiatric complexity. So how is that going to apply uh, in our setting. And this is where I think measurement-based practice can be very important because we can measure, if we're measuring our outcomes all the time, we can actually measure the effect of the implementation of those interventions which were carried out under more rigorous conditions. Obviously, the opioid epidemic and those with opioid use disorders is very much on the mind of the nation at the moment. Would one of you kindly talk a little bit about this notion of EBP and opiate use disorders. One of the key issues in opioid use disorders is that we have effective medications to treat these conditions. And yet most of the people who go to drug treatment for an opioid use disorder, whether that's addiction to oxycontin, oxycodone, or addiction to heroin, may not get the opportunity to obtain those evidence-based medications. I think that's really a scandal that many treatment programs that say they are treating these conditions actually don't offer the services that might make the biggest difference to their, to their patients. What are some areas where loved ones can look for resources or better information about how to find treatment or quality care for their family yeah. members? There are a number of treatment locators uh, that are available. SAMHSA has one, uh, and uh, as do many of the other uh, federal offices. And so a treatment locator it can be very helpful. Oftentimes they're not complete, um, and they may not represent what's in your area, but uh, we encourage you to, to call or reach out to a treatment locator and, and find that. I want to encourage everyone to call a center that they've heard of or, or a place. Uh, uh, many of the intake workers at all of the centers are familiar if, if your situation or your family member's situation doesn't match. They are often are in positions to know uh, other resources that might be available uh, locally. Dr. Franklin, for many, access to care starts with one's uh, personal physician. And yet there seems to be this knowledge gap between what uh, PCPs know or may or may not know and what is needed for them in the behavioral health care world. Uh, I'm wondering if you might speak a little bit about the drumbeat for better integration between primary care and behavioral health care services, and what are our needs in that area? Well, there's been uh, good research to show that when behavioral health care is totally integrated in primary care, uh, outcomes are better. Uh, 
uh, at Shepherd Pratt Health System, we've partnered with Greater Baltimore Medical Center and have uh, really seamlessly integrated uh, behavioral health care in primary care practitioners' offices. You know, having uh, a counselor or a psychiatrist there, you know, part of the team, you know, able to uh, see pa a patient on the spot uh, that might need an evaluation uh, is far more successful than, you know, for instance, just giving somebody the number for, of someone that they would have to call and make another appointment with down the road. You know, the easier you can make it for people, uh, the better. And as behavioral health is treated more effectively, uh, it helps people's physical health. Uh, there's you know, lots of research to show that uh, the costs associated with people's physical health problems uh, go down and physical health improves as mental health is treated uh, aggressively and in an integrated way. When we come back, we're going to take a greater look at integration and all of its manifestations. Well, what led me to start my process of recovery uh, is really just getting to the point to where I was quite disabled. I was depressed to the point to where I really couldn't work. This was my first year of residency training. Obviously, the first year of uh, residency training, medical internship is a very stressful time. And I was just undone and you know, could technically report to work, but I was incapable of doing any work. I literally sort of laid on the floor of my office using a book as a pillow just sort of laid in a dark room from 8 to 4.30 every day for some weeks. The fact that, uh, that I really couldn't you know, answer my calling to help people was remarkable to me and it helped me overcome the, the real stigma I felt uh, that you know, had prevented me from getting treatment previously. To see myself as somebody that needed help as opposed to you know, somebody that was giving the help. Well, I first found a, a psychiatrist who was able to prescribe me some medicines which helped with some of my acute symptoms. In a couple of months, I could work again and more or less back on track. Uh, but things really didn't get all the way better. After I finished my residency training, I found a psychiatrist who could also do psychotherapy. Uh, and, and that was very helpful to me. Because what, particularly when you grow up with depression, your whole sense of self becomes sort of organized around that. And it makes you very vulnerable. And in time, I even moved on to a more intensive kind of um, psychotherapy, psychoanalysis. And you know, that really, I think, made me much less vulnerable to severe depressive episodes. Parents don't want to imagine that their children are, are depressed or are particularly ill. I was quite resistant to the idea that, that my son might be depressed and, and need treatment. I wish I had gotten my son treatment sooner, honestly. I would encourage any parent who has a thought that their, their child might be suffering like that, don't wait. You know, the, the sooner you can get uh, you know, your child treatment, you know, the better it'll be for them. Psychiatric and psychological care uh, was the beginning of my recovery, but it, it surely hasn't been the end. I've uh, gotten much more into exercise. Uh, I'm a triathlete now. After you sort of recover from the acute symptoms of mental illness, you make yourself more resilient by sort of increasing your capacity for enjoying your life. You might not know everyone in your community, but if you did, you'd see that people in recovery from mental and substance use disorders are all around. Reach out for support and begin your recovery journey. Join the Voices for Recovery. Strengthen families and communities. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referrals for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back. Uh, we just had a very good conversation about access to care through one's primary care physician. However, we all recognize, I think, that for uh, many with uh, substance use disorders and mental health issues that they may not be in very good contact with their primary care physician. In fact, they may often have gone years without seeing a doctor. Why is this a problem or is it a problem and how should we best address it? 
Sure, I think there are many ways that we can bring treatment to where people are. So what's one of the places that people do show up? Well, they often show up in emergency rooms. And that's what we've been learning recently is that emergency rooms can even be the site to begin long-term treatment of an addictive disorder. So people with opioid use problems have now been treated successfully in emergency rooms and started on buprenorphine. That's one of the proven medication-assisted treatments that we can now start in emergency departments around the country. And I understand that there's a greater use of peers or folks with loved experience who are working now in emergency departments. Yeah, I think that's really important, the entryway into treatment. And so um, that can be at knowledgeable family members or knowledgeable community uh, members can also be. And, you know, for many of us these days, uh, accessing the computer and uh, searches can be very useful uh, as a point into treatment. One of the things also, I think emergency rooms and inpatient treatment also for people who have, have an accident related to alcohol or other drugs or uh, uh, a suicide attempt uh, as well that can end up on inpatient wards that if we can, um, and this has been done actually in many places around the country, is have consult teams that can address uh, at bedside, mm -hmm. do a consult and, and determine whether there's any uh, substance related um, uh, conditions present um, and uh, begin to address it right there. You brought up the issue of recovery peers and that's something that we've done actually at Massachusetts General Hospital. Mm -hmm. We have an addiction consult team which uh, meets people in the emergency room on inpatient units um, that does an assessment consult with a peer. So they're a peer recovery coach, so-called recovery coach, that they're a peer in recovery that can break down uh, some of the fear and stigma and shame that people feel because they're a person with lived experience that then they can help um, make a connection, build rapport, and then help link that person to the next level of services. I would like to direct this question to Dr. Franklin. Um, and I'm wondering, how do you think the behavioral health care field can make services available that are more person and family centered? Uh, rather than meeting the needs of payers and the bureaucracies that we all work in? Well, every patient at Shepherd Pratt gets an individualized treatment plan. And, you know, we do our, our best to include the family in, in that treatment plan. It's one advantage of being part of a, you know, mental health care system uh, in, in that, you know, we are able to accept patients at whatever level of care they need and then move them along through our own system uh, to a different level of care, and it can be more seamlessly integrated. Uh, personally, I think having uh, more family therapists uh, involved earlier in the process, you know, having more uh, family discharge meetings, uh, so that it's not just the individual that understands their treatment plan, but also the people that are supporting them. Families have been an essential part of the treatment of adolescents from time immemorial. We've all recognized that if you want to do a good job with an adolescent who has an addictive disorder, you have to work with their families. Mm -hmm. Less well recognized is that the family is just as important for adult patients. So if we want to help people enter long-term recovery, we better be thinking about all the influences around their, their outcomes. And families are number one in both supporting and sometimes even undermining recovery. So that's, that's why we really want to focus on that, both for research and for practice. For all of us who've worked in the system, we know that engaging family members is often uh, quite a challenge at times. Any tricks of the trade that you may have learned along the way about how to engage family and significant others uh, in a person's treatment and recovery plan? I think meeting with the family is really important so that the family feels like they have an opportunity to be engaged. So often, particularly with people with uh, severe or longer term problems, so often family members have lost hope that anything can make a difference. And so having, seeing professionals or other individuals, and this in my view is where peers can be extremely important, seeing viable human beings that have hope in the person's recovery can be really helpful. Uh, and so. Family members need to be brought in, as Dr. Compton and Franklin have mentioned uh, earlier, and uh, they're very important. If you think about sort of having a person, they, they're often taken out of their normal environment, put in a treatment center, and then when they go right back, what reason do they have to hold things together without the this, this support, or I think of it sometimes as a pit crew, the, the, the people around them that have to get the person back on the road and, and into recovery. They really, that is a very essential thing. And sometimes family members just can't do that all by themselves, and that's where an outsider, like a peer, who's, who knows the ropes, so to speak, can be very helpful. 
Well, I think we certainly have open research questions about what, where can peers be most effective. We've seen them be useful in terms of follow-up. You know, I mentioned earlier about emergency room care as an entry point into treatment. But what about a few days later? That's often when peers might do a follow-up phone call or a visit to help make sure that people are moving forward in the direction that they want to go. I think that's one way that, that, that we're beginning to prove the value of peers and where they can be helpful and, and, and also sometimes what the limits are of peer support. So things like recovery checkpoints, telephonic support uh, have all been revealed as emerging best practice to help uh, one sustain one recovery. I think we're seeing a lot of programs like what you talked about, uh, Dr. Kelly, at uh, Massachusetts General on that have peers sort of embedded as a part of the treatment team. but. A newer thing is to have people who are work in that context do some of the more active follow-up. For there's been a long, long uh, history of sponsors and things like that. But sponsors, and they can be very helpful. But having someone that's mm -hmm. actually a part of the team uh, adds a different kind of level of support and, and I would say accountability for the recovery plan and, uh, of the individual. I think a key component of the peer piece is the flexibility. They can provide greater flexibility at time outside of normal services. Uh, the normal clinical services. So I think that's one of the things is just the greater flexibility that no, uh, the peers can provide in, in service settings and outside of service settings. I wonder if there's an anecdote that comes to mind to anyone about utilization of a peer in your particular uh, service arena. Well, I can tell you a couple of good studies that have been that have proven this point very dramatically. Uh, one was a, a study that actually was done many years ago in 1981 where uh, patients were randomly assigned uh, to receive one of two uh, types of referral to mutual health groups. Um, and um, one of them was a standard referral. So the idea was uh, given a meeting list to attend AA and a 12-step uh, meetings um, and encouraged to attend because it, it was suggested that it would be beneficial to their recovery. The other condition to which patients were randomly assigned was the same thing, but it was connection with a peer on the phone, they connected with a peer, and that peer was designed to link them, kind of a warm handoff, what we call a warm handoff, to a peer. Um, and it, the findings couldn't have been more dramatic. And these are people who had never had any prior experience with mutual health groups, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, in the standard referral, nobody went to their first meeting. In the warm handoff condition, every single person went, and they went to roughly three meetings in that first month. Which is a great example uh, of you know, the fact that giving somebody a list does not give them hope. You know, the, uh, these people, what they need more than anything at that point in the process is hope. And somebody with lived experience can communicate that you know, better than any clinician or any piece of educational material or any list we have. And I think if you think about it from uh, just, a, 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 just a, a physiological uh, phenomenon in terms of how difficult it is, how nervous people are just physiologically in the post-acute withdrawal phase um, to then be told, I want you to go and find this community resource and cross the threshold by yourself. Right. Okay. For right. As opposed to You're a wreck, but I want you to do this thing that's going to make you super nervous. Right. So <laughs> it, it's somewhat naive uh, to do that. And of course, this proves it. These kinds of studies prove how difficult that is for people, mm -hmm. even though it's in their interest to do it, because if they do that, their outcomes are going to be better. And most people want that. They want to live a better life. Um, it's just that that warm handoff, as it were, the connection with a peer has proven to be extremely powerful and effective in terms of getting the people across that threshold. When we return, I'd like to focus a little bit on some of the barriers and obstacles that have gotten in the way of folks accessing uh, these kinds of treatments and services. My story is yours. I am a mother. I'm a father, a son, a daughter. I am in recovery from a mental illness, a substance use disorder, with support from family and community. We, we are, are victorious. victorious. Join the voices for recovery. Our families, our stories, our recovery. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. We started as a pure advocacy organization that we were here to put our face on recovery, offer ourselves as living proof that recovery is real. Shortly thereafter, we evolved into recovery support services 
And now we have three recovery community centers. We provide telephone recovery support to 500 people weekly. We do recovery coaching services. We train recovery coaches. We've trained more than 20,000 coaches across the country and worldwide. 10% of people that, that meet the criteria for a substance or alcohol use disorder actually go to treatment. So that's a lot of people that are out there that, that need help and that need support that aren't getting it through the, the traditional treatment system. Our staff and our volunteers are, are trained to know how to find resources for people. And that includes uh, treatment, detox, outpatient, um, you know, support groups, things like that. We have 28 staff positions. Uh, recently, over the last year or so, we've hired 10 recovery coaches who work in the emergency department. We started this program about a year ago. Our coaches are dispatched to the hospital when somebody comes in that the staff identifies as, um, you know, being appropriate to talk to our coaches. I met one of the uh, recovery coaches in the emergency department uh, in Manchester Hospital in March of 2017 after pretty much a lifelong uh, addiction to alcohol. The hospital staff asks that person if they'd like to speak to a coach. If that person says yes, then they call one of our coaches in. I talked to one of the counselors at the hospital and she asked if I would speak to uh, someone that was called a recovery coach. I had no idea what it was, but that person was from a company called CCAR. We treat the person we're seeing as the best resource on their own recovery. We ask them, how can we help you with your recovery today? And they respond. They might want to go to detox. They might want to go to outpatient. Our coaches are all trained to support individual pathways of recovery. My first thing was to say, I want to go to a recovery program, but I'm not going to meetings. So I refuse to go to meetings. So if you can find something like that for me, then I'd be more than happy to go and I look forward to going. Our recovery coaches have a tremendous knowledge of, of facilities and options and, and ways to, uh, paths to recovery that if you're just trying to do it on your own, uh, I don't really think you could do it. I have no doubts in my mind that it had not been for CCAR, I know I wouldn't be sitting here today with 10 plus months of sobriety, that's for sure. As of this time, January of 2018, we've seen more than 700 people since our program started in March of 2017. And out of those 700, we've connected 97% to ongoing care, which is remarkable to us. What the Connecticut Community for Addiction Recovery does is maintain and sustain that recovery once it has been initiated. The other thing we actively do that's received a lot of attention is we call people once a week and check in on their recovery, so telephone recovery support. We've been providing this service since 2005. Trained volunteers that are many times in recovery themselves reach out to people that need help and that would like a phone call and they call once a week and just check to see how people are doing in their recovery. And we currently are calling about 550 individuals each and every week just to ask them, how's your recovery going today? People call participants up on the phone to see exactly how they're doing with their recovery. Is it going good? Is it going bad? What do you think? What else you can do to maybe help and reassure them that there is a light at the end of the tunnel you know, and then at the end, what you would do is say, well, we'll call you back next week to see how you're doing. Let them know that someone is concerned about them and really thinking about them at that time. First and foremost, we care. <laughs> and people don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's really the essence of what we are. We're just a, an organization that's by and for people in recovery. I get to meet people, I get to talk with them, I get to share my story, I get to listen to them, I get to help them, I get to ask them questions and use them as resources. And you never know, they may give me a resource that I can put into my resource binder and use to help someone else.
Also, we have different types of supports that happen in our centers. So we have something called the awe recovery meeting. Many times with traditional 12-step meetings or other types of, of support meetings, you have to uh, identify yourself as, as an addict or an alcoholic or things like that. We welcome anybody that has a desire to, to be in recovery. We define the recovery community as people in recovery, family members, friends, and allies. So that's just about everyone. Anyone that's interested in promoting recovery or helping people maintain and sustain recovery are welcome. The most important thing the CCAR does is to provide people with hope and the knowledge that recovery is possible. And we do that by being living testimonies of the power, hope, and healing of recovery, putting that face on recovery and providing that recovery support services are key to what we do and what we do well. People come in here and volunteer, they access recovery resources, they, they look for work, they look for jobs, they attend a variety of training and workshops. If they want to come in, they want to go to detox, we will find them a bed that's available. We have a long, long list and what we do, we just keep going and keep going and keep going until they find somewhere for them to go. The recovery community does have some challenges as we move forward. I think a lot of attention has been brought to recovery and treatment because of the opioid crisis. We would love to expand our programs. We would love to expand our services, have more community centers in, in different towns and expand our, our coach program to more hospitals. There's a lot of talk but not a lot of action. And so how do we take our voice and really turn that into resources where, where viable solutions can be funded well? And I think that's a lot of advocacy, not only by organizations like CCAR, and, and we are strong advocates, but by the entire community. And it doesn't just have to be people in recovery. It has to be the family members, it has to be friends, it has to be allies. Everyone is touched by addiction. We need that voice to elevate. We need that voice to rise, not just get pushed aside like it has in the past. So that's a, that's a challenge, but it's also a tremendous opportunity. Making just one connection during recovery from mental and substance use disorders can put the strength of family and community behind you. We're all connected, offering encouragement, support, and hope. Join the Voices for Recovery strengthen families and communities. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referrals for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HEALTH. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back to The Road to Recovery. Dr. Compton, I'd like to ask you a question about what, is, what are some of the more common barriers that we often see to quality care? Well, when we think about the barriers to care, I think they come in many shapes and sizes. They can be as simple as people aren't aware of what treatments they might even need. So they go to their physician or they go to other places and ask people, and the person they ask may have no idea. So we have knowledge barriers like that, both within, the, within families, even within clinicians that they may go to. So that's one of the goals of this very program, is to educate the public about what they should be asking for. I also think even if you know what you need, you may not be able to obtain it because it isn't available where you live. And since most treatment needs to be implemented where you live, because that's where your recovery is going to be, you're going to be back in that community, so we need to make sure you have the supports where you live, that's a big barrier. Even if it is available, do you have insurance or the financing that makes it possible to obtain the services you need? These are all the kind of barriers that people have to overcome, and it, 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 sometimes it's a miracle when people can enter mm -hmm. recovery. And the good news is that they, we are addressing those barriers sort of one at a time. Yeah, over half the counties in the United States have no mental health professional. I mean, it really is, is stunning the great swaths of, of this country that have you know, no access to care, even for people who want to avail themselves of it. Uh, it's one of the reasons uh, at Shepherd Pratt we've you know, really pioneered the use of telepsychiatry to reach people in uh, rural areas who otherwise wouldn't have any access to care. 
We've been doing a, a, a study that we just launched recently in collaboration with SAMHSA, in collaborations with the Centers for Disease Control, and even in collaboration with the Appalachian Regional Commission to bring services to opioid users in rural parts of our country. And it's not an easy thing to do because they don't have the psychiatric services. They may not have even general health services in remote rural areas, and yet that's where the patients are that have serious problems with opioid use disorder, whether that's with heroin now or with uh, the prescription pain medications that have devastated so many communities. One thread I'd like to pull out just a little bit is the notion of stigma and the personal stigma, that this sense of hopelessness and despair that individuals feel, and shame uh, often, uh, that keeps them themselves from seeking help to begin with. Before you even get to barriers with the, tr the treatment itself, there's the Oftentimes you see people who are embarrassed, uh, awkward, know they've had some decline in their functioning, they're not doing family roles or other things, and making that first step to actually ask for and sometimes even demand treatment, call on the insurance company to see what even resources are available in your plan if you have insurance, those kinds of things. Those first steps that the person takes are really hard. Mm, absolutely. I, I think that's one of the, just coming back to a, a point made earlier, is that why it's so uh, important and helpful to integrate behavioral health into primary care. Because people are, are, are less inhibited to go to a primary care doctor than they would be to go to a mental health specialist or an addiction specialist. So uh, the more that we can co-locate behavioral health specialists into primary care mm -hmm. to make it just normal that we're treating the whole person, mm -hmm. mental health and physical health, right there, that uh, hopefully primary care clinicians are sensitized and sensitive to these other conditions which are very prevalent and which affect the efficacy of whatever else they try to do in the physical health realm. Don't forget, right? We're talking about these mental health and, and uh, substance use uh, disorders affecting all, all the other kinds of uh, health conditions. So the, the more that we can address them, we can reduce uh, the, the, the barriers of shame and stigma uh, and increase the public health impact of the kind of clinical care that we can provide. There's another barrier when we're talking about the diversity of our population, which is provision of care for those who might be culturally or linguistically different than the provider. How can we do a better job of that? I think this is true in all of behavioral health, that we struggle to make sure that our treatments and our approaches to patients are relevant to the, to the people who are coming to see us. So one key example is, how do we work with American Indian populations effectively? How do we make sure that the treatments that we think can work in other populations apply in, in, in new and other areas. So can we work in uh, Indian country to make sure that medication-assisted treatment will have the outcome that we want it to? Can we adapt mm -hmm. some of the behavioral approaches to be useful and appropriate in those new cultural contexts? This is a research question as well as a very practical implementation question. And Dr. Everett touched on earlier that using the internet and social media to reach underserved groups and really you know, being you know, very aggressive about outreach to the leaders of those communities and not just sort of counting on the healthcare system uh, to be an entree for treatment. What is the role of government on the federal, state, and local levels? What, what can government do to, uh, to remove some of the barriers and obstacles or at least diminish them? Well, I, I, I think it's interesting that you know, we're talking currently about infrastructure. A lot of talking congressionally and nationally about infrastructure and providing infrastructure uh, to improve the safety of our bridges and roads, for example. And for the first time in our history, deaths from overdose has surpassed motor vehicle accidents. So if you think about that and you think about providing infrastructure, I think it's public health infrastructure we also need in addition to roads and bridges, kind of the infrastructure on roads to recovery and bridges to recovery, uh, as well as these other kinds of infrastructures. So I think federal government and state government has uh, in the face right now, right currently right now, we have this opioid crisis, opioid emergency uh, that is surpassing motor vehicle accident. So the kind of infrastructure I think that we need to talk about in addition to these other kinds of infrastructure is public health infrastructure to, to meet the needs of families who are desperately seeking help. 
I'd just like to add that we, we, the government isn't just one entity. So I represent the research part of government. And so I think a key way that the, that the federal system can contribute is by supporting research that will come up with new approaches so we can do a better job in the future of treating these conditions. I'm very pleased that we have effective evidence-based approaches <laughs> for addictive disorders, but they're not as good as they could be. So what can we do to make, a, to, to make them better in the future? That's our job as researchers. And one of the things that SAMHSA's doing, particularly in the era of SAMHSA that we're in right now, is really strengthening the technical assistance uh, uh, or, um, uh, <coughs> opportunities so that there is a shorter, so we can shorten that gap between what's known as uh, good evidence, best evidence for most likely thing to work the most for most people, uh, what's, what's likely to work best, and what the clinicians in the field are actually providing. And so we're really ramping up our technical assistance in that regard. Also, just in terms of um, the way that just our conception of how we treat addiction and mental health disorders, um, that we have tended to treat um, addiction, at least, as the, the, the metaphor I use is like a burning building. So we recognize the burn, a, a building burning. We want to put out the fire. We're successful about putting out the fire, but we fail to actually attend to the architectural planning and providing build, the building materials necessary to rebuild the building or that person's life, mm -hmm. and also allowing building permits. So one of the barriers that people often face is they can't get a job, they can't get a loan because of a prior criminal record related to their drug use. And so this prevents them from getting any traction, any mm -hmm. foothold in recovery, and actually feeling any hope that they can actually have a better life. And so uh, just broader conceptually, trying to understand uh, th these aspects of um, uh, uh, removing the barriers, addressing these barriers, particularly legal barriers that prevent people from getting loans, access to housing, education, and jobs. All really excellent points. And when we return as a panel, take a look at how do we do a better job at identifying issues uh, with individuals, substance use disorder, mental health issues, earlier on in their behavioral health career, if you will, uh, so that we can avoid some of the more uh, deleterious effects of those disorders. My family and friends are always with me, no matter where I may be. Sharing stories from home helps me sustain my recovery from my mental and substance use disorder. Join the voices for recovery, our families, our stories, our recovery. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. There are three important steps to accessing care. If you have insurance, call your insurer and ask about coverage and if there is a network of preferred providers. If you don't, States have funding to provide treatment for people without insurance coverage. Visit SAMHSA's website for more information. Call for an appointment. If they can't see you or your family member within 48 hours, find another provider. Quality treatment providers will offer the ability to be seen and treated soon. Some even offer walk-in services. Look for the five signs of quality when researching substance use disorder treatment programs. They include accreditation, medication, evidence-based practices, families, and support. Check on a program's accreditation and if the program and staff are licensed or certified in the state. The program should offer FDA-approved medication for recovery from alcohol or opioid use disorders. Because one size does not fit all when it comes to treatment, look for a program that offers a variety of evidence-based practices and options. Ensure that family members are included in the program. And finally, ask what ongoing and long-term treatment and supports are available because addiction is a chronic condition. Women who are pregnant or may become pregnant should work with their providers. There are safe and effective treatments and recovery options, including medication-assisted therapies for use during pregnancy and breastfeeding. More information is available on SAMHSA's website. The first step for families who are concerned their loved one may have a mental illness is to encourage them to seek treatment with a qualified mental health provider. Primary care doctors may be able to provide support, guidance, or a referral. There are many resources available to connect individuals and families with proper care. SAMHSA's National Helpline is one place to start. The helpline is available 24 hours a day, every day, and is free and confidential. Available in English and Spanish, the helpline provides referrals to local treatment facilities, support groups, and community-based interventions. 
SAMHSA also provides an online treatment locator for providers based on your zip code. Family support is a key ingredient to recover from mental illness. Research suggests that family involvement leads to better outcomes. Family therapy improves outcomes and is available for individuals and families. Families can learn how to support their loved one's recovery. For more information on family education, visit SAMHSA.gov. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. Welcome back to The Road to Recovery. I'd, I'd like us to take a look at uh, what are some, what are some evidence-based practices used in screening uh, that might help us identify who at a very early age uh, might have early onset of some symptomology that, uh, that if nipped in the bud or if addressed early on uh, might help them later in life and prevent uh, uh, more grave circumstances. And I throw that to the panel. Well, I'll, I'll start here. I, th I think one of the ways we think about early interventions, we might be thinking in terms of prevention here. And I think it's remarkable that an understanding of what puts people at risk, what are the risk factors and protective factors that we can change can make a long-term difference. For instance, we now know that family-based interventions with middle school kids, that means supporting parents do a better job with their emerging teens, mm -hmm. helping to provide loving, nurturing environments, and also the appropriate levels of supervision that parents need to provide. That if you, when that is taught to parents of early teens, those kids grow up much healthier. They are less likely to start down that pathway of drug use, alcohol use, tobacco use, and even prescription drug misuse. So that tells us that we can make a difference by starting early, particularly with these family-based approaches to support. Dr. Everett, I know that uh, CSAP has uh, a variety of methodologies to deal with uh, drug awareness and prevention uh, for addictions. What specifically is SAMHSA doing in the area of mental health prevention? Yeah, so CSAP, our Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, uh, has a number of different uh, activities and things that it works on that have to do with uh, working with uh, school-aged children and um, identifying environments of social and, and emotional learning that help the individuals um, uh, have a healthier uh, ways of coping, ways of sort of working with, uh, with things so they can work through uh, programs. We, uh, prevention is a difficult thing sometimes to study uh, because it's hard sometimes to know that something that you did early prevented something that happened much later in life. But as a rule, we're getting better with our information and our ability to collect information on the kinds of interventions uh, that we do. It is remarkable how long some of the prevention studies are. We know from many decades of research that early trauma, whether that's child abuse and neglect, leads to a whole host of problems as kids develop through their teen years or become adults. So can we do something about that? about that? The answer is yes. We now have interventions that can support families, reduce child abuse and neglect, and really lead to much improved outcomes for those youth as they go through their teen years. I think that reminds us of the developmental trajectories and the importance of those early childhood environments. That's really exciting for the field um, as I hear you talk because it, it, uh, it demonstrates that we can be more effective at what we do and, and offers yeah. hope. I think also in terms of the, you know, uh, when to screen, you know, we talk about this issue in science of pro positive predictive value, that is, of those who are screened, what percent of those actually have the illness. And this is why we screen after certain ages for certain diseases, like we have colonoscopy after a certain age, and screen for certain cancers after a certain age, because it's more likely that you're going to have those diseases at that time. It mm -hmm. creates a, a public health efficiency. And I think the same when we think about substance use disorders, we know that they have a young adult onset, a late teen and young adult onset. So knowing that, that's where we need to be placing our energy and efforts and resources if we want to have a dent in destabilizing long-term addiction patterns. And I think uh, focusing on the 14 to 25-year-old segment of the population and screening there, intervening earlier, even if it's just beginning a conversation, 
about substance use, uh, even at a secondary prevention level, not necessarily primary prevention, secondary prevention. In other words, there may be all, already signs and symptoms of substance-related conditions. To be able to begin that conversation, to destabilize uh, emerging patterns uh, of the illness. Because I think if we're serious about putting a dent in substance use disorder, we have to start where it's most likely to have its onset, just the same as we would with any other kind of illness. Also, some of those yeah. emerging adults may not have developed the serious problems that bring them automatically to an emergency room or other places. So mm -hmm. unless we go out of our way to ask the questions about, do, do you have the, the symptoms of addiction? So we can intervene early and interrupt that long-term, long-term trajectory. So, so uh, what I'm hearing from the panel then is we need to be more sensitive uh, to some of the issues that might arise that we might typically ignore. Otherwise, and I'm, I, I suppose I'm wondering uh, uh, to move from the theoretical and philosophical to the practical. Where, where are some of the access points where that conversation might take place? Well, I think stigma oftentimes keeps us from asking important questions. Uh, I, I think you know, oftentimes uh, parents and families um, are you know, reluctant to know. Uh, and I think stigma is one thing that keeps people from wanting to know. And, and the more we can do to make you know, screening for substance abuse and mental health issues uh, just commonplace, you know, part of uh, a, a standard sort of pediatric evaluation at, you know, given ages for everyone and not wait for uh, an emergency room visit or a drug overdose to, to begin to ask those questions, but ask them of everybody. Uh, I think we'd be going a long way towards um, reducing stigma by normalizing that these problems are incredibly common uh, and, and need to be screened for routinely. I uh, thank you very much, Dr. Franklin. I have heard uh, I have heard that there's some promising practices in that area uh, around the country. Is anyone f familiar with or would like to offer an anecdote about early screening and intervention that uh, uh, that perhaps might be useful to the audience? Well, one way to think about this from a research perspective is that we've had proof that screening for heavy drinking can make a difference. So a physician asking a patient, how often do you drink, how much do you drink, and then pointing out that drinking more than four drinks a day for men or drinking more than three drinks a day for women can put your health at risk will actually make a difference. Some of those people will reduce their drinking to keep their lives safe in the long run. That's a really important way that physicians can make a practical difference in the lives of their patients. Thank you very much. It, it seems to me this is a nice segue, and I'm going to turn to Dr. Everett because I'd like to learn a little bit more about what SAMHSA, uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, is doing in the way of supporting uh, some of these early screening and intervention initiatives. We also have a large focus in uh, school-based or education mm -hmm. uh, and prevention, uh, working with uh, teachers and in school systems because, you know, for many individuals, it's, it's actually pre-adolescent era that, that we need to start setting the stage and doing groundwork with regards to prevention, teaching kids that there are other uh, areas. SAMHSA also has a large number of uh, projects that are oriented toward college campuses, and we know, you know, for kids that go the path of college that mm -hmm. drinking and or other drugs uh, these days in particular can be a major risk and can be a significant derailing event for, for kids that otherwise would have done well. And so a focus on working with the campuses and leadership in college campuses is very important. Absolutely. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, both in the uh, SUD side of things, um, collegiate recovery programs and separate housing right. arrangements. And then uh, within mental health, we have programs like Active Minds and NAMI on campus uh, that are helping uh, students uh, remain in school and address their issues earlier on. I, we are getting close to wrapping up this show, and it's been quite exciting uh, uh, talking with all of you. What are some of the emerging best practices in the way of integration? What are some of the ways that we can bring early screening and intervention uh, within the behavioral health care setting by in involving and engaging uh, primary care physicians? We've talked about what some of the barriers and obstacles are. Uh, towards reaching that goal, but we're a work in progress and we're doing better. 
Um, I'm wondering, in that context, uh, do any of you have any final thoughts that you think the audience ought to hear? Well, one important phenomenon is that substance use problems don't exist all by themselves. For instance, and what, what I mean by that is if somebody goes to a physician and they smoke cigarettes, so that's identified. Well, those are people where we should ask very carefully about their use of alcohol, about their use of illegal substances, and about their mental health problems. People that go to a psychiatrist for treatment of depression and anxiety or other mental health conditions should be asked very carefully about their alcohol, drug use, and tobacco use, mm -hmm. because these things overlap in such important ways. So there should be no wrong door when it comes to getting a full assessment and full treatment for these conditions. No wrong door sounds very recovery-oriented systems of care-like. And so, Dr. Kelly, I might have, if I might turn to you, uh, given your ROSC expert expertise, um, any final thoughts in that area? Well, I, I think um, understanding the nature of substance use disorders uh, uh, we know that these tend to be chronic disorders for people who come into specialty care settings. Uh, and recognizing that we are talking about a continuum of care. Now, we have high, these are very high volume, high burden diseases that cost a lot of money to treat as a society, as a country. Uh, and it's not just in the United States, but all over the Western world, the middle and high income countries. These are major sources, of public health uh, problems. And uh, so we have to think about how can we use our resources the best. So we have clinical resources, which tend to cost more. But we also have many indigenous free community resources. And the recovery-oriented systems of care piece is recognizing as a society, we have a lot of resources that we can connect to, draw on, and help treat this top public health problem, mm -hmm. not just in clinical settings, but connecting the dots between free indigenous community resources, as, as, as Dr. Compton mentioned, uh, identifying uh, and bringing in leaders of different cultural and underserved communities to be able to uh, uh, bring their uh, comment and uh, viewpoint into these kinds of uh, settings so that we can reach more people. I think my sort of closing word would be hope. Don't lose hope. If you're a person out there that's suffering with uh, the uh, addiction or a family member or someone else who cares about someone who is addicted, don't lose hope and don't give up on that person. and Don't give up on yourself. There's always hope. People can always get better. Uh, it takes different things for different people, um, but don't give up hope. I would echo Dr. Everett and, and just say that treatment works. Uh, you know, people can recover and uh, become, uh, you know, productive again. But also that you know, I think we need to you know, be pouring vastly more resources into this problem you know, than you know, we currently are. I mean, literally hundreds of thousands of people are dying in this country every year of substance-related uh, you know, disorders. And you know, we just really aren't seeing the numbers of resources put into research, treatment, uh, outreach, what have you, as you know, one might expect, you know, given uh, the massive amount of death and, and suffering out there. Uh, so uh, I, I hope that uh, you know, there'll be you know, more resources put into this down the road. I want to thank you all for being here today. We've had a marvelous panel. I want to remind you to celebrate Recovery Month each September and throughout the year. For more information, visit the Recovery Month website, and thank you all for joining us today.